Welcome back to the Sword Studies series here at the Academy of Historical Fencing. Hi, I'm Nick Thomas, and today bringing you a close-up look at a very special Napoleonic era British sword, and that is the Welsh Fusilier Officer's Sabre or Sword. So this is actually a sword that I've been hunting for for over a decade, really, and it's um, an incredibly rare sword to find. I only know of about uh, maybe seven others. There must be a few more out there, but they are an incredibly rare thing to find. And well, why is it special to me? Well, a few reasons, really. You notice it's the Welsh Fusiliers. Well, I am, in fact, Welsh, although usually the, only the people that realise that are English people because they can only hear a small bit of what they would think of a Welsh accent in my uh, voice. Um, but yeah, so I am Welsh. Um, I have a huge passion for British Napoleonic era swords, even though I collect a little bit uh, outside of those um, sort of parameters, but generally that's my focus. And specifically on infantry swords. So to have a Napoleonic era infantry sword regimentally marked to a Welsh unit is something that would be incredibly special to me. And it's also super unusual, so it's not common to find regimentally marked swords in the Napoleonic period. So if you go up to, to the uh, Victorian period, you'll find lots of regimentally marked swords. Although the regimentally marked swords in that period usually follow typical patterns that were in use at the time. So you'll, for example, commonly find um, 1845 pattern and uh, 1897 pattern infantry officers' swords that are regimentally marked, but in form they are just the same as every other sword that every other officer was carrying. But that is where this is unique. So, as I talked about in the last few Sword Studies videos, the uh, infantry swords at this time did vary quite a bit because although they did have the regulation spadroon, the 1796 infantry officer's sword, some officers were carrying sabres, initially against regulation and then allowed but without pattern as I talked about with the uh, the little shamshir bladed um, flank sabre in the last video that's here behind me, uh, which were roughly based on the light cavalry sword above it. And eventually then pattern swords were int introduced in 1803, but not all regiments uh, adopted that pattern sword. Some did their own thing, and some may have already had their own type in beforehand. So we don't exactly know when this sword um, was first introduced, this Welsh, Fu Welsh Fusilier sword. All we know is that it was roughly in use between around about 1800 and 1820. Now, it was probably adopted somewhere between about 1803 and 1806, I would, I would imagine, based on various factors that I don't, can't really go into right here, because that's a bit too much detail. But the point is, is that only a few regiments adopted their own type of sabre, and roughly five. So if you look at Robson's book on, uh, on British military swords, he shows five types of regiment, specific types of regimental swords. So not a regulation sword that then has a regiment marked on it, but their own type that actually visually looks different to everything else. So yeah, so only about five regiments did that, so super unusual. Um, the 95th Rifles, for example, did have their own sabre, um, 95th being the famous regiment of Richard Sharp, of course. So yeah, they had a type of um, Shamshir sabre similar to this, but with steel fittings, and that was quite unusual in itself, but um, that's for another video. Now, um, getting back to the Welsh Fusilier's sword, well, let's have a look a little bit as to who they were and, and why they're kind of a bit special and why they have such a unique sword of their own. So. First of all, you'll notice that when you're looking at the um, the text on on the, this actual sword on the langets as they're called, it says Welsh or it says Welsh, not Welsh. It says Welsh fusiliers, and the spelling of fusiliers is quite unusual as well, uh, with the the two e's in there. So language was not standardised in the 18th century. It started to become standardised in the late 18th and really properly standardised in the early 19th when dictionaries started to become more common. And there was not a standardization of language, and the, the Welsh Fusiliers liked to use an archaic version of Welsh, which is Welsh, and of course it took on a new meaning to them, and it was important to them. And actually the regiment still carries that spell in today, and it's, it's part of their whole identity. So uh, it's just a, 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 an older spelling that they've clung on to because of tradition. Now, Fusiliers, what does that actually mean? Well, in the Napoleonic period, it, doesn't really mean what it originally meant, but it does mean something. So fusilier came around about in the late 17th century, and a fusil from the French describes a flintlock mechanism. So 
Until this time, most military firearms used matchlock mechanisms where when you pull the trigger, a serpent comes down with a lit match and touches the powder and sets the, the primer pan off. There were other mechanisms around, uh, like wheel locks, for example, that were more complex, but the most common military lock mechanism was the matchlock. And the flintlock, over time, throughout, as you get towards the later part of the, uh, the 17th century, flintlocks started to take over. And fundamentally, it was revolutionary because although it's a more complex mechanism, it can be um, made readily, uh, ready to fire within you know, seconds taken off the shoulder as opposed to having to light a match cord, for example. And so fusiliers were troops that carried fusils, which is a term that I said it came from the French, but it's, um, and, and, and the, technically the meaning came from flint. Uh, it was a term that got adopted in Britain, so you will see reference to fusiliers regimentally. You'll see the actual muskets with flintlock mechanisms being called fusils. You'll see accounts of officers carrying fusils, even up to the American Revolution, for example. So it just meant a flintlock mechanism, usually a flintlock musket. I'm showing a pistol here because it's nice and small and convenient. And yes, it was revolutionary, but of course, the uptake was slow, so it could replace everything in the army. Uh, initially, they would have been quite experimental. And the first Fusilier units in Britain were intended to protect artillery pieces, protect the guns. Now, as you can imagine, that's a job that matchlocks are not particularly well suited to because the, the, the time when artillery is especially vulnerable is on the move. And what is a matchlock not particularly good at? Well, being made readily available at a moment's notice. So a flintlock is ideally suited to that scenario of protecting the guns. And so the first Fusilier units, including the Welsh Fusiliers, which were called the 23rd Foot, um, they were intended to protect the artillery pieces, and that's how it came about. Now, of course, they very quickly became an elite because they're equipped with the best musket, the latest technology. But as time went on, um, early into the 18th century, flintlocks were just by, 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 by far the norm. And by the Napoleonic period, flintlocks were just universally the standard mechanism in use for that time. And so Fusilier, by the time you get to the Napoleonic period, doesn't really mean anything that it used to mean. But they maintained the name and what it basically meant by that time was an elite. So it had come to mean that anyway and they maintained that name Fusilier and some regiments that were never actually um, doing the original Fusilier duties got the title as well because it was an elite um, de de basic designation to a unit. So what you're talking about is kind of heavy infantry. So you'd expect them to be some of the best in the army. And that's why they kept there that sort of term for the sort of esprit de corps. So that's a little bit of history on the Welsh Fusiliers. Now we need to go into um, why this sword sort of came about. But um, I'm going to stop it there and just give you some measurements. So as you can see with this um, Welsh Fusilier sword, is it has the shagreen sharkskin or racekin grip. They all have these. There are no examples with ivory that I've ever encountered. And even the colonel of the regiments, his sword that survives at one time, uh, also had the chagrin. So I don't think they ever had anything else on there whatsoever. And you'll notice that there would have been gilt all over this. So this is a, um, a copper or brass, it looks like copper hilt with gilt over the top. There's some of it left um, around the various parts of the lion head and the langets and in the guard here. And you'll notice that the scabbard is a uh, brass or copper and leather scabbard, typical for infantry officers, although again some used metal, particularly for horseback. Um, you'll notice that on the last video I mentioned that some sabres were, were carried using two ring suspension systems and some using a frog stud and I did mention that some sabres have both and here we go, here is a sabre that has both, which means it can be carried with a two ring suspension system or a, a shoulder belt. I frequently wear these swords without their scabbards and that's obviously the right way to go for understanding what a sword is like. But it is curious to look at what a sword is in its scabbard for in terms of comfort and daily wear because that is important. I did mention on the cav when I was talking about the cavalry sabre that cavalry scabbards are rather weighty. So there you go. The entire sword and scabbard is 1260 grams. Okay, so not bad at all. And if we take the sword from the scabbard. So you notice this sword actually has a slightly flared tip on it. This is what we would call a yelman, although because of its 
it's been service sharpened so many times. The Yelman is a little bit shorter than I think it would have been when it was original, particularly when you look at some other surviving examples. This also is um, razor sharp on both the front edge and this Yelman, which is highly unusual. I'll talk about that a bit, little bit later. And you're also going to notice that this blade is completely unfullered, just like the Shamshia blade that I showed on the previous Flank Officer's Sabre. So, this Sabre is 776 grams, so just under 800 grams. Now, that is actually towards the higher end of the scale for an infantry Sabre, especially when we consider that it is a stirrup guard and doesn't have a more complex or elaborate guard adding more weight. So yeah, it is actually towards the higher end of the scale, and I would expect that because this is intended as a fighting sword for an elite infantry fighting unit, which would be more expected to get into hand-to-hand -hand than many units. And so at um, 776 grams, yes, it's, it's, it's reasonably weighty, um, not excessively so by any means, and I would say, although the weight is towards the higher end of the scale for infantry sabres, there is clearly a lot of hilt weight here. These langets are rather large. The lion pommel and back strap section is much larger than normal. And there are additional embellishments to the guard here and here, which all add a little bit of weight here and there. So, and, and it's beaked the pommel and grip section. So fundamentally there's, despite the fact that it's a plain stirrup guard in terms of protection, there's a fair bit of extra detail here that add, does add a bit of weight. And as a result, the balance actually isn't as far forward as it might seem, especially considering that it has that Yelman section. So the balance is it's just under 11 centimeters, whisker over four inches. That's, there's a bit of a trend going on there with some of the ones I've done on this sword study series. They all seem to be around about that at the moment. Uh, I've, I do promise you there are actually um, all sorts of swords that are in my collection with various balances. For some reason, everything is around about four inch, uh, sort of 10 centimeters at the moment. But anyway, a sword with, uh, let's call it an 11 centimeter roundup, 11 centimeter balance is, is nimble. So this is a good weight, not excessive. The balance is, it makes it a nimble sword. I did say that it's lost a tiny bit of metal where it's been sharpened, although that's going to be just a few grams because this has been sharpened many times over. If we took take a look at the blade length, it is intact with its full blade length at 76 and a half centimeters. That is a touch over 30 inches. That is a really common blade length for infantry sabres in the Napoleonic period. I have said in previous videos that they did vary a lot, and that is true. But around about 30 inch is super common and a super typical sort of average for these swords. Now, what else can I say about this? Well, the thing that makes this, this sabre unusual compared to many, well, actually there are many features. The langets are absolutely huge. The lion's head is unusually large. The beak section is, although we've seen other sorts of beaks, and I showed my light cavalry saber that's behind me with uh, the beak on it, it's still not that common a feature. And these elaborate details here and here, the unfollowed blade, the yelman section, that all, those are all unusual features for British swords in that period. Now, in the Shamshir video, the Shamshir flank officer type saber, I mentioned that the British adopted these kinds of swords specifically the Shamshir types, after service in Egypt. Now, that doesn't mean that all units went there, adopted them, or that all the individuals back at home didn't just jump on the bandwagon and take up the fashion, which we know they absolutely did. But the Welsh Fusiliers, the 23rd foot, were actually at the, uh, the campaign in Egypt against the French, and Mamluks fought alongside the British. And the Mamluks at that time were known to have incredibly elaborate clothing, swords, muskets, tons of gold and jewels all over them. They were incredibly elaborate and it wasn't just for show. The, the Mamluks trained as warriors from almost birth and they were incredibly respected within the British military at the time and incidentally the French military. So the Welsh Fusiliers were actually out there on campaign fighting. They did fight alongside the Mamluks, they did experience them, and we know, because we have various accounts, that swords changed hands, um, often captured from the battlefield or sold on, captured from the enemy, all sorts. And so these Mamluk swords were well respected because the Mamluks were a warrior culture. And 
I talked about that last video, is that that, that flank officer sword I said is very much a Sham Shia style. Well, this is more actually what we'd call a Kilich style. So the Kilich and the Sham Shia have a lot in common and, and, and generally the, the Sham Shia evolved out of the Kilich. But the, the fundamental difference between the two is the Kilich normally has slightly less curve to the blade and has the characteristic Yelman. And if you look at um, a lot of original Kilich, the Yelman section is absolutely massive. It flares out to a huge degree, providing a massive amount of cutting power at the tip. Other features that are common is the, the pommel type section is very much beaked, even though there isn't a knuckle bow on a Kilich typically. They have the, very much the beaked pommel and they have very large langets. And so what I'm saying is, is that the Welsh Fusilier's sword, more than any, has drawn characteristics from the Kilich more than any other of the British swords with this big bulbous pommel, which is sort of certainly reminiscent rather than being a copy of the Kilich, as are the langets, as is the blade with the Yelman. And so, yeah, more than any of the British swords, this one is by far the closest to the Kilich, even though we typically think of the Shamshia as being the influential design on British swords at that time. And so you could rather say that both the Kilich and the Shamshia had significant influence, although they are very closely related swords. So typically a Kilich blade doesn't have much profile taper for the first half to two thirds of the blade, and then it has a massive flare at the tip. Well, this certainly follows the uh, first part of that, so it doesn't have much profile taper. So if we look, it is 3.1 centimeters at the shoulder. It's, uh, let's say halfway down the blade, it's down to 2.8, so it's lost a very small amount of our profile taper. I will add though that this sword has been service sharpened many times over and it's only been service sharpened roughly on its first half of the blade length which is very very common because that's the bit for actually cutting people this is the part for parrying so you don't need to sharpen this part you're just taking metal away so it's lost a tiny bit part of that might be the sharpening if we get to just before the that small yelman starts we've already fled a little bit back out to 2.9 at the Yelman, it hits 3.14, and at its widest point, 3.23, maybe a little bit more, 3.26. And so you can see it does flare. It does have that Yelman section, this flared tip, and it is sharpened. And it would have been a little bit more broader than that before it had been service sharpened many times over. Now the fact that this sword has been sharpened many times over would suggest that this has gone to war and perhaps gone through many campaigns. Now, I have no idea. We never know the history on these. People always want to jump on antiques and say it was at this battle and with this service and must have been used. The truth is, unless there's some provenance with it, we have no clue uh, whether it left the country, whether it actually went into battle, we don't know. What we do know is this is a fighting sword for a regiment that got into the thick of it an awful lot. So the Welsh Fusiliers, they actually had two battalions in, in this period. The second one was raised during the Napoleonics. The second battalion actually only was involved in two of the worst campaigns for the British, uh, whereas the first were involved throughout most of the famous battles of the Peninsula campaign. And the second battalion fed officers into the first and troops. So there's every chance that, a very good chance in fact, that this sword was involved in the Peninsula campaigns. And the fact that it has been service sharpened many times over certainly reinforces that fact. So to have a bit of a closer look, I did say that the lion's head is unusually large, particularly as it's a half lion's head. As on the 1803s, the lion's head can stop at the knuckle bow or it can extend into the section of the grip here. So this is a half lion head and yet, it is absolutely massive, really bulbous, and I think that's purely part of, you know, copying that Kilich aesthetic. Same with this beaked section to the grip. Did they grip it with a pistol grip like I showed on the flank officer video? Maybe. Or did they just have this as a fashion to copy the Kilich without understanding 
you know, whether they wanted to use it or not, we can, we're never going to know. It might have been both because you can grip it with a hammer grip, although it's quite snug. So perhaps it was intended to be used that way. It's a completely symmetrical design. You'll notice that on the blade here, there is some gilt left inside here on both sides of the blade. So that's typical of infantry officer sabers at this time, having various military embellishment and decoration. It usually doesn't mean much beyond having things like royal ciphers and general decoration. And Now looking at the distal taper. So you'll notice if I get you a good view in there, the other shoulder, it has this kick out, which is a feature that I've usually only seen on these Shamshia flat type blades, because normally what happens is they have a very wide shoulder and then usually complex distal taper to very quickly essentially bottleneck it down into a narrower profile. Whereas with these Shamshia blades, they seem to have this little butt, if you like, little block to give it a strong shoulder before it immediately goes into a very thin profile. So yeah, that block there at the shoulder is 7.3 millimeters. So that's, that's quite respectable. And then immediately drops, if I can get in there, immediately drops to 4.3 or 4.5 after that block. If I go to approximately halfway along the blade, it is 2.8. So that's a lot of distal taper. And if I now measure it at, let's say halfway along the Yelman section, it is 1.5 millimeters. And at the absolute narrowest point, at the tip, it gets down to one millimeter. So what you have here is a very flat blade that still actually has quite a lot of distal taper. It's very thin at the tip, and that shows you that, what well, explains to you why it is quite as agile as it really is. So that is the close-up to the Walsh Fusilier sword. I'm now going to give you a little extra in terms of measurements to the the grip, so the maximum space within the knuckle bow is 9.2 centimeters. The minimum space inside here is 4.5, ranging down to just under five centimeters. The quillen block, so from quillen to shoulder is 3.8 centimeters, the full width from quillen to the to the start of the knuckle bow is 11.3 centimeters and the full length of the grip and pommel is 11.2 centimeters so it's quite a compact hilt although i have seen more compact that shamshir i showed and the last video was very very restrictive in terms of its space indeed and so this is a sword as i said i've been looking for for a very very long time and it's important for so many reasons one because it's one of the few regimentally marked infantry sabers two because it's a welsh sword which to me is very very interesting three because it's the one that most shows comparison or or the the traits of the the killich rather than the shamshir and it's also a combat unit that saw a lot of action. So there was one Welsh Fusilier officer, for example, that the, um, the, muse the Welsh Fusilier Museum, Museum calls the real life Richard Sharp. And he took part in every major battle that the Fusiliers fought in the peninsula. So he fought uh, 20 battles, uh, seven sieges. He, he, um, he also um, was on a ship that caught fire. He was involved in all sorts of actions, was horrifically wounded in battle and yet survived some horrendous injuries. And so, you know, I'd like to think that the sword belongs to somebody like that indeed. The other thing that is incredibly important with this sword is when I made the video about the last flank officer's sword, I made the point that we call it a flank officer's sword, but we honestly don't know. It could be a dress sword for a light cavalryman. It could be some kind of um, field officer, high ranking officer, general staff. 
it could be a, a yeomanry's dress sword, it could be a volunteer's um, sword, it could be so many different things, a, a Royal Navy sword. We don't know if it's dress, we don't know if it's a undress sword, so those two terms is, is usually a dress wear and fighting sword loosely, but it doesn't always quite apply. And so this is one of the few stirrup hilted swords that we can say absolutely definitely this is an infantry officer's fighting sword and not anything else. So that makes it pretty special as well. Now, what do I think of it from a fighting perspective? What do I think of it? Well, you know, it's, it's kind of curvature, its length and its weight is actually not so far different to the Black Fencer 1796 infantry sabers, the steel versions that we so commonly use at the club. It's actually a whisker heavier and the balance slightly further back. And that's because the, the hilt weight that's in it, because it, it has got a fair bit of mass there. But yeah, it's not so, so different. It's a little bit more agile than those because, you know, yeah, it's, it's this very thin blade, a whisker shorter and, and has that little bit of extra hilt weight. But yeah, it's not a million miles apart. For me, what I think is absolutely fascinating is the Yelman section and the fact that it's fully sharpened on that back edge because British swordsmanship at that time did not teach back edge cuts. And in fact, throughout the 18th century, the use of the back edge is almost unheard of. There's, there's perhaps just one mention where they're definitely using the back edge. So the back edge of the sword was not being taught and it's super rare to find British swords of this period that have a sharpened back edge, whether, whether it's a spadroon or a sabre or a, or a cavalry, um, a heavy cavalry sword, whatever. It's really, really unusual to find a fully sharpened back edge. And I don't know if that's because the officer that had this, maybe, or not this necessarily, this sword, but this pattern, maybe they saw the killiches and things like that and decided to copy them, or maybe they genuinely wanted to use the back edge. We'll never know, but I think it's really quite fascinating. So there you have the Welsh Fusilier Officer's Sabre. Uh, one last thing to mention is that, is this a flank officer's sabre? Well, it probably is. Robson believes, or Robson in his book suggests that this is the flank and field officer's sword for the Welsh Fusiliers. So flank officers are your flank officers of the light and grenadier companies. Field officer are usually your ranks of major and above, so your senior officers within the regiment. And is it just for those officers? Well, probably because that was the norm at the time. And yet the Welsh Fusiliers were clearly kind of doing their own thing. Did other officers within the regiment also use these? Maybe. Well, I'm not sure we'll know. I'll keep scouring the records. But as far as it stands at the moment, we associate this with the flank and field officers of the Welsh Fusiliers. And if you'd like to see some more examples of these, there are three in museums. So you can see one on the National Army Museum's website. You can see one on the Royal Armouries uh, website. And I have posted a photo of the one that is in the Royal Welsh Fusiliers Museum. So there's a few other examples that you can see. The last thing to mention about this is, as you can see from the museum examples that I'll put in the description below, it is a completely standardized design. Most of these surviving examples have this exact blade, this unfollowed blade with the slight yelman section. Although there are two examples that, uh, that I found on auction sites that don't actually have the yelman section. So clearly there is a little bit of variety, but the hilts were all absolutely identical. And one final detail, and that is we know the maker of this sword. So the scabbard here is marked up to Prosser. Now, Prosser was by far one of the best, most respected smiths, swordsmiths of that period. He made the finest swords, was also involved in the early pipeback production swords. Every single surviving example that we've come across so far of the Welsh Fusilier sword of this period is by Prosser. When the um, pipeback officer swords took over in 1822, they actually adopted their own version, which seemed to have unusually long blades. And where there is the GR cipher, they have uh, their own, the fleur-de-lis. And so far, all of the swords of those 1822s were also made by Prosser. So there seems to have been some significant link there. Now that's not so surprising because Prosser was the, you know, the main maker to, to the royalty, to the king and the Welsh Fusiliers had quite a bit of favour and connections there, so perhaps there is a bit of a royal link there. But either way, all the ones that we've come across so far are made by Prosser. Prosser was one of the finest makers of the day, and so the Welsh Fusiliers sword is not only unique, really interesting the way it's styled after the Killich, 
and of the finest quality of saws that will be made as well. So there you have it. That is the Welsh Fusiliers Officer's Sabre. To me, um, it means a lot. It's a rare, a fascinating and rare piece and shows a lot of the, the fashion and culture that was being adopted within the British Army in that particular time period. Thanks for watching. There'll be many more in the Sword Studies series. And if you haven't subscribed, please do so.